Apple recently introduced their new phones for 2020, which for the first time include four different models, the iPhone 12 mini, 12, 12 Pro, and 12 Pro Max. Back in the early days, from the original iPhone to the iPhone 5, they only introduced one new model per year. But starting in 2012, with the 5S and 5C, Apple began releasing two iPhones, and in 2017, three new models. And their decision to release multiple iPhones has been met with some criticism. You'll often find complaints on social media that buying an iPhone has become more confusing than ever, since customers are forced to browse through several tiers of iPhone models with different features and prices, whereas Apple used to offer a one-size-fits-all solution that was much simpler for customers to understand. So in this video, I'm going to explain why Apple went from releasing one iPhone per year to four. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and I'd like to thank Ting for sponsoring this video. This was the second place winner of a voting poll from three months ago. Sorry for taking so long to get this one out, but if you'd like to participate in these polls, make sure you're subscribed and they'll start showing up in your mobile activity feed. All right, now let's start off with the number one reason why Apple's selling so many different iPhones today, and it has everything to do with how the smartphone market has changed since 2007. Back then, there was only one iPhone, and no other manufacturer was selling anything like it. Other smartphones, like the Nokia E62, featured plastic keyboards with small, low-quality displays and clumsy operating systems. So if you were shopping for a smartphone and wanted a touchscreen, the iPhone was your only option. But its groundbreaking new technology didn't come cheap. Its retail price was $500, which was already more expensive than the average $300 smartphone. But if you included the required two-year contract with AT&T, the iPhone's total cost was over $900, which was insanely expensive back then. But as competitors caught up and smartphone technology matured, Apple reduced the iPhone's $500 price to $200 with the 3G model. In 2010, the smartphone industry had already changed dramatically compared to two years prior. Google's Android operating system was running on dozens of devices as manufacturers tried to cut into the iPhone's market share. And they did this by offering features that the iPhone didn't. Take, for example, the HTC Evo 4G. It had a 4.3-inch display and faster 4G cellular connectivity, whereas the iPhone 4 featured a 3.5-inch display and was still using 3G. Not to mention, customers could get those extra features on the HTC Evo for the same price as the iPhone. This marked the beginning of something I call the spec race, where smartphone companies would try to outdo the other by including beefier specs or bonus features like a kickstand or stylus. It didn't really matter how well the smartphone worked, as long as each model contained a cool gimmick that separated it from the pack. This wasn't how Apple viewed things, though, and these two opposing philosophies to creating a smartphone would influence how the industry developed through the next decade. For example, in 2011 alone, over 93 new Android phones were released, whereas Apple continued to offer just one new model, the iPhone 4S, and flagship Androids of that year had some pretty impressive specs, the most common being large displays. The Galaxy S2, HTC Resound, and Motorola Droid Bionic all had 4.3-inch displays, while the Galaxy Nexus took things even further with a 4.65-inch display. This made the iPhone 4S's 3.5-inch display look tiny in comparison. And this differentiation helped Android outsell iPhones for the next few years. In 2012, Apple did their best to keep up, though, by increasing the screen size of the iPhone 5 to 4 inches. Although by that time, most customers felt it wasn't enough, while journalists questioned why Apple didn't go bigger. And the reason why they didn't had everything to do with Apple's design philosophy. They didn't believe that making a phone bigger would necessarily make it better for users. Instead, they believed a phone should be designed around the thumb, which is why the iPhone 5 offered a display that was slightly larger, but still easy to navigate one-handed. In fact, they released this ad to illustrate their point. Your thumb, it goes from here to here. This bigger screen goes from here to here. Now, that's either A, an amazing coincidence, or B, a dazzling display of common sense. Pretty sure it's the common sense thing. 
But while the iPhone 5 was on sale, customers made it clear that they preferred bigger phones with bigger displays. Android devices outsold iPhone about 4 to 1. At this point, Apple was faced with two problems. First, consumers shopping for a premium smartphone wanted one with a large display. Second, low-cost phones were selling better than ever, especially in emerging markets like India and China. Now, consider the iPhone 5. It was one of the most expensive phones on the market, with one of the smallest displays, so it didn't really satisfy customers of either demographic. Apple was trying to design a one-size-fits-all smartphone for customers with opposing needs. It was clear that they needed to take a new approach with the iPhone. And that's when they decided to create the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. But these models wouldn't be ready until two years later in 2014. So in the meantime, Apple released the iPhone 5S and 5C in 2013. This was the first time ever that Apple offered more than one new iPhone model. And it was their attempt at attracting customers looking for a more affordable smartphone. You see, at the time, smartphone data plans were much more expensive than they are today with some of the most affordable plans charging $70 per month for unlimited data. So it was important for budget-minded customers that iPhones be priced as low as possible. But luckily, that situation has changed today thanks to carriers like Ting. They offer smarter data plans based on what you actually use, which means you're not overpaying for data you don't need. Their Flex plan starts at just $10 per month, and their 5GB plan is just $25. And those are no strings attached prices, no family plan requirement, and no contracts. That's one of the best things about Ting, it's flexibility. You can use as much data you need month to month, and your bill adjusts accordingly. But what about the network itself? Well, Ting operates on both Verizon and T-Mobile networks to ensure reliable nationwide coverage and access to fast LTE and 5G speeds. Not to mention their award-winning customer service that's always available if you have any questions. Switching to Ting is easy. Just head to ae.ting.com to check compatibility with your current phone, create an account, and pick the best plan for you. Ting will send you a SIM card that you'll pop in your phone and activate in minutes. So experience the next generation of Ting Mobile and see how much you could save and get $25 off at ae.ting.com. All right, now when it came to the affordability of the 5S, its price started at $200 with a two-year contract, while the 5C was $100. But that savings came with several compromises. The 5C had old technology from the iPhone 5, except with a cheaper plastic housing instead of metal. Because of this, most customers opted to pay the extra $100 for the 5S, and Android users still weren't tempted by the device's smaller 4-inch display. But in 2014, Apple was ready to unveil their completely new iPhone strategy that was two years in the making, with the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Priced at $650 and $750 with no contract, it was clear that Apple was aggressively targeting the premium market. Not only was the 6 Plus the most expensive iPhone since the original, but it featured a dramatically larger display at 5.5 inches and 4.7 inches for the 6. Apple had finally delivered iPhone models that rivaled other premium Android devices, and customers' response was overwhelming. The 6 and 6 Plus achieved record-breaking sales numbers, with a 41% increase in its first quarter sales compared to the 5S. From that moment on, it was clear not only to Apple, but every other smartphone manufacturer, that customers weren't afraid to pay more for premium features. And that pushed the industry in a completely new direction, with the iPhone 7 being the last flagship model with a $650 starting price. In 2017, Apple began their price hike strategy, testing just how much customers were willing to pay for a premium smartphone. They released three new models for the first time. The iPhone 8 started at $700, while the 8 Plus was $800. But neither of those compared to the iPhone 10, which started at $1,000. Now, this was a pivotal moment in the iPhone's history, not only for its record-breaking price, but also a record-breaking number of new models. And Apple received a huge amount of criticism. People complained that the iPhone 8 essentially had the same design as the 7, and that the 10 was priced way too high. But despite these concerns, the iPhone again enjoyed a record-breaking year, with the 10 becoming the best-selling smartphone in the world for 2018 and helping Apple achieve a 15% boost in revenue compared to the previous year. 
Now in 2020, Apple took things even further by releasing five new models, the SE in the spring and the 12 mini, 12, 12 Pro, and 12 Pro Max in the fall. It was the most iPhone models ever released in a single year and finally allowed Apple to cover both customer groups that they failed to satisfy with the iPhone 5. Premium smartphone customers could have a super large display and the best camera system available for $1,100 with the 12 Pro Max, while budget-minded customers could purchase the SE, which had much of the same technology as the 8 with the processor of the 11 for just $400. And since that made the iPhone SE more powerful than $1,000 Android devices, the model was a huge success fueling a 13% rise in smartphone shipments for Apple at a time when the entire market was experiencing a 16% decline due to COVID. So by offering more models, Apple is no longer forced to make the iPhone a one-size-fits-all device, which would be very difficult in today's market where customers are more segmented than ever. Some people prefer a device with the biggest display and battery possible, while others prefer a more compact device that's easy to use one-handed. And of course, there are those who just want an iPhone for the lowest price possible. All right, guys, thanks for watching till the end. And don't forget to subscribe to help decide which topics I cover in the future. And I'll see you in the next video.